Thank you everybody for joining. This is the Green New Deal, a solution to the big meat problem, question mark. So we'll be talking about how to end factory farms and why the Green New Deal is going to be part of that solution. It combines two of my absolute favorite topics and I'm so excited also about the speakers who are joining us tonight. So I'm Alexis Badenmayer. I'm the political director of the Organic Consumers Association. And tonight we are joined by Mackenzie Feldman and Sean Sebastian and Garrett Vlad and Seth Watkins. So I'm going to introduce each of the speakers. I'm gonna read their bios to you. I know we're just getting started and people are joining us. And then I'm going to ask them each a question particular to what they're working on now. And then we'll get deep into the Green New Deal. And so we'll start with Mackenzie Feldman. Mackenzie is the founder and executive director of Herbicide Free Campus an organization with the mission of eliminating herbicides from schools. Her campaign resulted in the entire University of California system going glyphosate free. She worked with the coalition to get herbicides banned also from every single public school in Hawaii. She now is working in addition to Herbicide Free Campus, she's working as a food research fellow for Data for Progress. She's produced some excellent reports that she's gonna tell us about tonight. Um, but first I wanna give Mackenzie an opportunity to tell us just a bit about what it was like to run that campaign to get glyphosate out of University of California schools um, and any advice that you have for anyone else in the audience who would like to try that. Sure, thank you so much for the introduction, Alexis. Um, it's an honor to be on this panel amongst you all. For that campaign, yeah, we're, we're, we're still going and we've expanded now to schools all across the country and we're focused not only on getting glyphosate banned, but really all synthetic herbicides. But glyphosate really caught the attention of the UCs because of all the lawsuits that were happening, um, especially Lee Johnson, the groundskeeper who got cancer from glyphosate. And I think the UCs wanted to um, kind of jump out ahead of the curve and eliminate glyphosate so that, you know, so that they um, don't have the liability risks. Um, but it was really about student power. And I think for anyone who's interested in just making a change in their community or their school, um, for us, it was really, you know, just um, let, having students realize how much power they have. They're attending the school. They should have a right to know and, and a right to say what they're being exposed to we're not even talking about farms where it's a whole other complicated set of issues to eliminate herbicides, but with schools, we're really not even trying to grow food. It's just for aesthetic reasons. So it's really pushing back against this aesthetic ideal of these big green spaces and really um, introducing new ways of managing land and students writing in letters. And I know uh, OCA helped, helped a lot with the petition to the UC president and all those things. So they all added up um, and and yeah, now they're, the UCs have gone glyphosate free and we're working with them to, to figure out all the alternatives. So, yeah. That's really exciting. It's awesome that there are so many great lawn care alternatives that homeowners can use in addition to people who are doing sports fields, et cetera. It really works very well as far as I can tell from what you all have accomplished in California. So that's good stuff. Let's move on to Sean Sebastian. Sean Sebastian is the senior strategist for rural people and planet first campaigns at People's Action. In 2019, Sean served as the Iowa organizing director of the Working Families Party and movement politics organizer for Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement Action Fund, one of our favorite organizations working against factory farms. Sean is the organizer and director of the Fed Up, or was the organizing director of the Fed Up campaign at the Center for Popular Democracy, where he organized working class people of color to demand full employment monetary policy at the Federal Reserve. Sean is an alum of New York University School of Law, a member of the New York Bar, and he was a lecturer in law at Columbia Law School, teaching law and organizing for social change. So Sean, I know that you've been involved, being in Iowa as you are, you've been involved in the 2020 campaign since the get-go. And a lot of that involved educating candidates about rural issues, about factory farming, 
uh, about the potential for a Green New Deal to bring in regenerative agriculture. Um, so what do you think was gained through that conversation? I, you know, I feel like it was a lot. I feel like a lot of progress was made. And, um, you know, for anybody who, you know, isn't totally excited about this election, tell us why we should be, why we should vote, why this election matters so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Alexis, for inviting me on this panel. And thank you to everyone who is uh, watching and listening right now. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to all of you. Um, and yeah, so last year I was in on the ground in Iowa working with Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement, which has a 40 year history of working for environmental justice and economic justice with farmers in Iowa. And um, really it was, I was learning from uh, the organization and its members of like how to create a farm and food system that's good for people and planet. And um, there has been a wide consensus about how to do that. And the central pillar of that is breaking up big ag, breaking up corporate ag. Like that is something that we need to do first in order to break their stranglehold because we know that the way they farm is bad for the environment. It, it's a net contributor to 10% or more of greenhouse gases and that there is another way to farm regenerative agriculture that can actually be a carbon sink. But in order to get to that place, we need to break up big ag first. Um, and I think one of the things that we found and that was has been frustrating for Iowa CCI for a long time is that um, there is just not a lot of um, progressive or even you know left of center knowledge, policy knowledge about agriculture and about um, the and, and about the economic and environmental harms of our current corporate ag focused system. So during the Iowa caucuses, for better or for worse, you know, honestly, even as an Iowan, I think it's for worse. <laughs> Iowans have a ton of influence over the national conversation. Um, and we use that kind of like privileged position to really push forward our vision of a farm and food system that works for everyone. And we worked really closely with the Sunrise Movement um, to kind of encapsulate what we thought a Green New Deal for rural and agriculture would look like. And the central pillar of it is antitrust to break up big ag, fair prices for family farmers, and paying farmers for the regenerative ag, uh, ag practices that we know are good for the environment. So we were, there were a lot of different pieces to it, you know, there's, but it's ultimately like those you know, legs of the stool that we need. And we were able to advocate for that in this pretty wide field at the time. And uh, both Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren both fully adopted that platform. So it was the first time since, I mean, je arguably Jesse Jackson in 1988 that mainstream uh, presidential candidates had adopted a platform similar to that. And that represented not just one candidate, but an entire wing of the Democratic Party. So there is there are really great plans out there. The Sanders plan and the Warren's plan are Warren plan are really great. They were obviously taken incredibly seriously, and there's a lot of policy work behind it. And we're seeing, you know, great strides in terms of uh, you know, Cory Booker and Elizabeth Warren working on an antitrust bill with uh, John Tester and obviously the Booker CAFO moratorium bill as well. So there's a lot of different pieces that are in place that um, are ready for us to take up, right? But they obviously have no chance of passing whatsoever if Donald Trump wins. There's a lot that is, a, that is at risk um, in this election, including the very fundamentals of our democracy. We know that Donald Trump has signaled that he will not accept the results of the election, that his re-election strategy is to um, use, uh, to sick his lawyers on as many different states as possible to invalidate votes. His strategy is voter suppression. And if he's successful in that, like any sort of democratic change at all, let alone progressive change, let alone on the issues that we care most about will be impossible. We've seen what Do Donald Trump has done with Sonny Perdue's USDA 
and what he's done to this country in general and to the most vulnerable people in it, particularly immigrants and people of color. So this is really a harm reduction election, I see it as. I think that we all have a responsibility, in my opinion, to vote to get fascism out so that we can live to fight another day, as uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez says, so that we can actually fight for this agenda and the pieces of it that we think um, as, as hard as possible, right? Because if, if Donald Trump wins again, we're gonna be playing a lot of defense and a lot of us are gonna be playing defense for our lives. Um, but if we, if we win this election and if we win the Senate, there is you know, the simple fact that we are still in a deep, deep economic crisis and a pandemic. And the only way, you know, there are, are 30 million people who are collecting unemployment of some kind right now. And the private sector is not gonna bring back 30 million jobs anytime soon. So that means the only solution is a massive, massive federal investment of the kind that we saw in, during the New Deal. We're in the greatest economic recession since the Great Depression. And what we need to respond to it is the biggest investment in our infrastructure and in jobs that we've had since the New Deal. And we have so much work to do and agriculture is a big part of that. Rural areas need upgraded water infrastructure, upgrade, they need rural broadband, they need um, rural electrification um, and upgrading rural housing to make sure um, and weatherizing rural housing. There's so many jobs that need to be done. And a big piece of this is also um, creating an agricultural system where there are more farmers on the land, not fewer, where there are more people earning a decent living and who are able to earn a de decent living by farming. That is key and that is a key part of the Green New Deal that we put forward. And I think it's really important to know that uh, Alexis, like you said, the Green New Deal is mainly, right now, the Green New Deal resolution is a four-page document that anyone can look up, and it's a set of goals. It's up to us to define what the Green New Deal is and what the content of it is. So I think we've got a, a lot of really good starting points. We've got the Bernie Sanders plan, we've got the Elizabeth Warren plan, we've got some good pieces of legislation, and we've got a huge opening, right? perhaps the biggest opening we've had since the Great Depression to push through the biggest, boldest policies possible. And I think that if we, I think that we can win those things, those basic things that we need, breaking up big ag, fair prices for family farmers and paying farmers for regenerative agriculture practices. Yeah, absolutely. I think it was really exciting how the Green New Deal got fleshed out in the Democratic Party and how it started to you know, develop a, a working plan um, aside from the aspirational language. So I think that that was some progress made. And if this election goes right, we can push for all those things. So I'll turn now to Garrett Vlad. And Garrett Vlad is a community organizer and climate advocate who comes from a long line of farmers in and around South Bend, Indiana. Since graduating from Notre Dame in 2015 with a degree in environmental science and sustainable policy, Garrett has been a leading voice for young Americans to fight to stop climate change. In 2015, Garrett led the US youth delegation to the Paris Climate Talks and helped cement the most aggressive warming limit in the Paris Agreement. Later, he helped launch the Sunrise Movement and in November, 2018, led a mass demonstration for the Green New Deal that went viral and set climate change as a political priority in the United States for the first time in history. He recently ran for the Indiana House of Representatives in South Bend. And that's what I want to hear about, Garrett. How did that go? And what's your advice for young people like yourselves, like yourself, who are passionate about these issues to get into politics? Absolutely. Well, Alexis, thanks so much for having me here. Really excited to talk to everyone about this really big opportunity and challenge we have in front of us. Um, like you said, I, uh, I ran for the Indiana State House this past spring. Um, what I saw here in Indiana is probably what many of you see in your own states, wherever you are, is that a lot of people aren't really addressing the most critical issues facing uh, our people. 
Um, I, as, as someone who sees firsthand what it's like for farmers to struggle, um, my family, I've seen uh, struggle to um, produce milk when I was growing up. And when the big uh, milk uh, corporations came into our area, I watched my grandmother lose her sense of purpose because she wasn't able to keep up what my family had done for, uh, for generations here. And it was that same anger that fueled me here when I, just, when I found out that there was, they were gonna build a massive uh, industrial park right outside of our city um, on some of the most fertile farmland in the entire country. And that was one of the moments that, that spurred me to, to decide that I had to step up because I saw that our political leaders didn't really know what was going on and weren't really up to the challenge of facing um, both an incoming uh, crisis of climate change, but also the existing crises that our farmers are facing right now with just an inability to exist as is, and also very little uh, opportunities to transition over to a more regenerative and sustainable form of farming. So we ran here, um, I'm, uh, I was 27 years old at the time, so I would have been one of the youngest people in the state house. We uh, was taking on one of the longest running uh, political dynasties in our state. Uh, the uh, incumbent was retiring after 50 years in office, 50 years. Um, and for 50 years, we really hadn't seen much transformation in our state. Uh, if anything, things have only gotten harder for working people and the city of South Bend and, and our state in general has been suffering. And running was incredibly exciting. I got to talk to people all around our city who felt like for the first time there was someone actually listening to them about the issues that were facing them. We were actually talking about what a Green New Deal could look like in Indiana for a state that's so based in agriculture to lead the way uh, in addressing uh, our food crisis, to get healthy food into our schools, to address the, the land and water crisis, to make sure we're preserving farmland and making it uh, richer and you know, absorbing carbon instead of the opposite. And what it would look like to bring more people on the land, like Sean said, we need more young farmers to come and have the opportunity to farm in a way that is what we need if we're gonna address the climate crisis. So that was a huge opportunity. We started that conversation here. We talked to people all around our district about this vision for a Green New Deal for Indiana. Uh, and a big part of that was what our farming could look like here in our state. And we came up just short. We came up just 300 votes short of winning uh, our primary in, uh, which got moved back to June. Um, but my overwhelming feeling after that campaign was of hope. Seeing 3,000 people come out and vote for our campaign, taking on one of the most entrenched family dynasties that our state and maybe our country has ever seen, uh, and coming just shy in the middle of a pandemic was not bad. <laughs> and there is definitely a hunger for change here in South Bend, and I imagine across our country. Um, and there's also just a deep hunger for people in my generation to start taking the reins of power. Um, because for so long, we've seen the older generation, frankly, fail to address the crises that are impacting us. And my generation feels it in our gut. I feel it in my gut when I wake up and see the reports, when I talk to my family who farms here about the struggles that they face every day. There is an urgent crisis and an urgent opportunity. And I believe it will only change once we have a whole new generation into office. And that's why I'm excited about what Sunrise is doing. Uh, Sunrise is building an army of young people to stop the climate crisis and pass a Green New Deal for America. So we are backing candidates all around the country who are championing this vision of a country that makes sure everyone who, ha everyone who wants one has a job uh, uh, as a part of this massive transition that we're a part of. And we are eventually going to have a, a situation in the next five years where young people are running in mass for office around the country. Um, if you are listening right now and are interested, uh, please reach out. I would love to talk to anyone who's interested in running. I think it's an intimidating experience um, and it is not really easy for young people to run for all kinds of uh, reasons. But if you are equipped with the right skills and support, uh, running for office can be a really transformative way of contributing to your community and showing what your community can do in this grand transition that we're all a part of. So grateful to be here tonight and to share more about 
my experiences. Yeah, I think that's awesome, Garrett. And you know, you you built your own little army and when you ran a campaign, you had to raise money, you had to organize volunteers. So um, I'll let you speak about that later. I wanna move on to Seth, but um, yeah, I think that that's like one reason to run for office. It's another form of political action that people can take and it, it is organizing and it's organizing it around the issues that, that you care about. So you might as well do it. I want everybody listening who cares about the Green New Deal and passing the Green New Deal to get involved at the deepest level. So our final speaker here with us tonight is Seth Blotkin. He is a fourth generation farmer on, he's the fourth generation of his family to care for Pinhook Farm. Founded by Seth's great grandfather in 1846, Pinhook Farm is a beef cattle operation located, located near Clorinda in Southwest Iowa. Seth attributes the success and longevity of Pinhook Farm to making happy cows and stewardship, not production, his top priorities. So Seth, um, you are not just a farmer. You also contributed to the Data for Progress report on regenerative agriculture and the Green New Deal, um, which I'm so jealous because you know I can barely do something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't garden even. It's so embarrassing. So when I meet farmers like you who are also scholars and activists and writers, um, quite intimidated. But I, I'd like to hear first, before we go to the report, I'd like to hear how everything is on the farm, what struggles you're facing in the day to day, what's that like? A lot of us have farming fantasies. You can set us straight about what kind of life it is, what the challenges are. You have to unmute though. Obviously we'll get into the, the issues that COVID has exposed as we get into this. So, you know, that's a challenge we're all facing and one that has exposed many weak links in the food system. Uh, the silver lining is it's been a, until the last couple of months, it's been an absolutely beautiful year. Um, we've had nice weather, but now we are in the midst of a pretty aggressive drought. So, um, the good news is you're able to work long days and get lots of things done. The hard news is you see the water in your ponds get lower and lower and you start to worry about your grass for next year and, and uh, making sure the cattle are content and cared for. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the nature of agriculture, so to speak. Um, the one thing I kept thinking about with this was just to talk to my audience and share a little bit of what I've shared with Alexis and also just about everyone who visits my farm is they get done. And the first question they always ask me is why am I not an organic farmer? And uh, you know, the answer I give them is, and, and it's kind of gives me hope in a way. The answer I give them is I'd love to be someday, but I have a lot to learn. And one of my favorite parts of the Green New Deal is actually putting funding back into research and extension for training. Um, our other panelists have already shared uh, we need policy that creates and support, that supports the farmers we have and creates opportunities for more farmers. And the beauty of when I look into the regeneration and the things that come, come from this, um, I do see opportunities. So, uh, A, I feel for my fellow farmers right now that are really trying to do exactly what they're told under a system that I think is kind of failing. Um, and they're facing the issues we see from climate, whether it's the derecho or the flooding of last year or some of these areas. But I also see hope because as I've started to work toward my own ecological solutions to problems, I've seen a lot of positive things happen. Um, I just wanna see it happen a lot faster. So, you know, I'd rather just answer questions from people, but I, I hope I've been transparent too, that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not at that level yet. And, uh, you know, some of the people we talk about today are people right now that buy my calves ultimately in some of those areas too. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is how can we move forward in building a better mousetrap and making sure that we're doing the right thing in agriculture. That's great. And there's, you know, there's a range of in regenerative agriculture and we chose as an organization, even though we call ourselves Organic Consumers Association, mm -hmm. Uh, we chose, as my boss, Ronnie Cummins says, to be ecumenical and to recognize that everybody's on a regenerative journey. And, and certainly, 
you know, you've got to start where you are and have this policy of continuous improvement. And that's where it is in, in organic as well. There's a range of, of even amongst certified organic farmers of regenerative practices. So it, there's room for everyone, all people who want to work the land in the regenerative movement. But Seth Watkins is being way too modest here because he's one of the exemplary regenerative farmers in the country, uh, despite not being organic certified. Well, um, so, um, one more thing. I just, I mean, we have a large audience and I, I want to let you know too, as a farmer, there are, you know, we're less than 2% of the population. So it really means a lot to me that, that you're here. And, and I really want to listen to you and get to know my customers. You know, people, businesses that don't listen to their customers don't stay in business. So every one of you is very important to me. Well, great. So I've encouraged all of the panelists to watch the question and answer box and to, to answer any questions that can be typed out that way and then mark questions that they want to answer live. So we will try to get to a lot of the, the questions from people who are watching tonight. But before we do that, I do want to go through the actual Green New Deal and, and so that we can know exactly what we're actually working with and, and what we're talking about. So the Green New Deal was actually the first piece of legislation, it's a resolution in Congress that talked about agriculture in the context of climate change, which is surprising now, but it shows you where we were a couple of years ago. And so, the Green New Deal was introduced in 2019 and it calls for, quote, working collaboratively with farmers and ranchers in the United States to remove pollution and greenhouse gas emissions from the agricultural sector as much as is technologically feasible, including by supporting family farming, by investing in sustainable farming and land use practices that increase soil health, and by building a more sustainable food system that ensures universal access to healthy food. So what I wanna start with, with all of the panelists, to let us know what we're talking about when we're talking about removing pollution and greenhouse gas emissions from the agricultural sector. And then what that caveat about what's technologically feasible means. And I think that that's the perfect entree to our discussion, which is centered around our boycott big meat campaign and encouraging folks to avoid factory farms, to support farmers like Seth, and to, to move agriculture, especially meat production, in the right direction. So perhaps we'll start with Seth, because you have the real on the ground expertise. Where are greenhouse gas emissions coming from agriculture? What part of that is attributable to meat and when we're talking about meats, greenhouse gas emissions, what does that mean? Because I think a lot of people have gotten the impression that the only way to avoid emissions from the agricultural production of meat is to not eat meat. So um, how can meat sometimes be part of the solution to climate change? Pretty complicated question. Um, I guess I'll start with some of the things that concern people was by propaganda about the green that would be obviously methane from my cows. Um, the beauty of integrating livestock into our agricultural systems and especially when you think about how much of our land isn't even suited for crops is uh, it's a it's a, a room on its ability to ca capture photosynthetic energy and break down the uh, I'm looking for the wrong word, and to be able to convert that forage into edible protein. And not everything can do that. Now, you know, the, the old saying, it's not the cow, but the how. I mean, I can go and do this in a manner where that creates pollution and creates problems and, and doesn't utilize the resources before me. And, and we have issues. But at the same time, when you start thinking about uh, the ability of livestock to recycle nutrients back onto our cropland, the ability of livestock to make cover crops work, which are a huge tool in starting to both protect our soil, but also turn agriculture into a carbon sink, that can be utilized by our cattle. Um, the other area that I'm fascinated in on the research side 
is actually there's a lot of data that says just grazing can have a heavier carbon footprint than feeding cattle because the cattle are around longer. Uh, at the same time, if I'm looking at that and saying, how am I grazing? Am I letting certain pastures rest? Am I getting the roots down? Am I planting trees with this at the same time? Then we start moving into that realm of, of uh, permaculture where we see our, our livestock being a solution to a problem again. Um, the other area that I see with it is when you look at much of a soil, especially in Southern Iowa and our Southern Iowa drift plain, that, that you know, a lot of policy has encouraged people to farm. And so this goes back where it's not about, I, I, you don't want to point fingers because this goes back so many farmers have been told, hey, this is how we're going to give you support to make a living on these acres. You've got to till it. Um, the sad fact with this is that as that's happened, we've depleted that soil of, you know, obviously it's aerizing the topsoil to begin with that fertile layer, but we've depleted it of nutrients and, and, and it's lost its, its productivity. When we start to have that cow out there grazing and putting that manure back down or incorporating that, that rapidly can rebuild our soil and can make our cover crops work. And then you see the soil carbon, organic matter actually increase, putting the carbon back where it benefits all of us. Um, the same when we look at any livestock in a system, uh, the manure is so important. You know, it's just, we don't want it all in one place, but with, uh, when we look at our dependence on the primary three nutrients, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, um, those are finite resources. And all of us who want to eat, we need to think about where we're going to be getting those from as our, as our population grows. Now, as we move into proper crop rotation, and, and again, that integration of livestock, some really good things happen. So um, livestock play a really critical role right now in sequestering greenhouse gas if we use them the right way. Um, the challenge in this is helping me and a lot of people I work with find better systems to do it. You know, one of the things I jotted down when you started, this might kind of sound as a shocker, you know, the state, the state of Iowa might actually be able to handle more livestock than we have now, but we just can't handle them all in one place. And it's, uh, the best way to describe that, you know, like if every little old lady has a cat, it's not a big deal. And then you get the one that has a hundred cats and you've got a really big problem. So that comes down to let decentralization. But the other challenge, we still have to make this system work. So if we're going to decentralize and, and have some of these opportunities, <clears throat> we still have to have ways to get the cattle through the process. I mean, they have to be harvested. We have to have packing plants. We have to have those things too. The other thing that I'm kind of excited about with grazing is I'm seeing it as an opportunity for young people to come in. So something we've done, one of the fellows that helps me now has a herd of meat goats. And, you know, as we start to add species to our operation, it didn't take any more grass because the goats eat something else. And that's the beauty of, I guess I don't care what it is, whether it's our landscape or our people or our, our lives, we've got to embrace diversity or we're selling ourselves short. And all of a sudden now here's an opportunity for a young person to come in with no land expense, but they can run the goats and the goats actually complement my cow herd. And then at the end of the day, the biggest thing I have to think about, and I really want data on, is how many trees do I have to plant for every cow I have to offset if I have any carbon footprint after that. And at the same time, when you look at mother nature, you know, I think it's important to point out that, you know, there are other ruminants, giraffes are ruminants, antelopes are ruminants, camels are ruminants. So all of them is, methane is a, is a factor, but when I look at, at the time being, what we can do if we do this right is so important and can create so many opportunities that we can balance it and we can mitigate it. And I'm told my farm is a, is a carbon sink, but I have still been asking scientists to give me the exact data and they always come out and I get different numbers. So again, we need more, we need more knowledge on that. Well, let's bring Mackenzie in because she was the lead author on the report that Seth contributed to about regenerative agriculture and the Green New Deal. I've got the report open on my desktop and I'm just looking at some of the things that relate to animals. And what Seth was saying about diversity in your farming system and the integration of crops and livestock is so important. So Mackenzie, what did you learn about that when you were putting together this report? And and what else do you want to say about the problem of agricultural emissions and greenhouse gases? Yeah, um, and I can just um, introduce people to this report for those who don't know. 
Um, so what Alexis is referring to is um, with my work with Data for Progress, we put out this regenerative farming and Green New Deal memo. And even though I was a lead author, I really, it, my, most of my work is really just compiling information from people like Seth and um, others who'd been in the field for a long time, like John Eichard. And at first we were really, you know, pondering, should we just be tweaking crop insurance and trying to improve that? And then, you know, we kind of took some time to realize like that's not my role as a young person and that's not the role of Data for Progress. Like what Data for Progress is a think, a think tank and our role is really to move the needle and to introduce just like the, just like the Green New Deal, like introduce what our vision is and not just small tweaks that can happen to the farm bill, but really like, what are we aiming for? Because frankly, um, like Garrett talks about with Sunrise, like we don't have time to just focus our energy on these little tweaks. Like we have to introduce this vision. And so I learned a lot from people like Seth and uh, what most of the memo is about is instead of paying farmers for um, the, each crop that they produce, it's really would be transitioning to this whole farm net revenue system where farmers are getting a salary, which would then, um, it would incentivize them to, to do some of the practices like Seth talked about, like leaving some of the land fallow and, and focusing on conservation and paying farmers for ecological services. I think one of the questions in the Q&A was, what are some of these ecological services? So it could be, um, and I'm not a farmer, so Seth will know a lot more about this than me, but some of them would just be compost, you know, low and no till, granulization, intercropping, agroforestry, so on and so on. So, um, and the good news is that a lot of these mechanisms already exist within, you know, the, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Services Program and the Conservation Reserve Program. These, these programs already exist. And the bottom line is they just need more funding. So um, Seth, I don't know if you had anything to add to the memo, but that's kind of um, generally what it's about. Yeah, I, I guess I think that uh, one of our biggest problems right now is our current farm bill has incentivized production on land, on some land that we really shouldn't farm. And it's focused entirely on production. And, you know, it's, it's simple economics 101 that leads to an oversupply, which leads to lower prices. And then we have all these other externalities with it. Um, I don't know if I need a salary as a farmer, but I need incentives or I'd like to see incentives to do the right thing instead of the wrong thing. And, and this is where, you know, some of the really low hanging fruit, geospatial technology can come in and show us what land is appropriate to farm and what isn't. And as long as we have this public private partnership called the Farm Bill, I think it's important that we're farming in a way that you get clean water and, and clean air and, and more carbon in the ground than we take out of it. And we can do that. So you look at these fields and, and the beauty of it is, you start identifying this land with the geospatial tech and, and you know, pay the farmer. Say, you know what, here's a great carbon sink. This is a massive wetland. We're gonna restore this wetland. Here's a place to plant trees. Let's not farm that because you're losing your shirt farming and it's not working. It's not helping anyone. And, and at the end of the day also, this isn't entirely a new idea. We had supply management in agriculture until the eighties. And well, the way I look at it, a, a big argument on the side of agriculture is kind of, let me do whatever I want because I've got to feed 9 billion people by 2050. Well, maybe we should say that's not carte blanche, that it's really a case that uh, if we really need this soil for 9 billion people, maybe it's more important that we're saving it and regenerating it for a time that it really needs to come. And, and the other part of the ecological solutions that I've seen, and this is where I talk about training. I mean, I, I'm an avid no-tiller, but I finally had to till some ground that was rough. It's, it's, it it's a learning curve. But every time I've applied a solution that's reduced my fossil footprint, whether it's moving to no-till or whether it's listening to mother nature and letting my cows have their babies in, in May instead of February, even though the industry says calving in February, I said, you know, mother nature, mother knows best. And, and all those things either alleviate stress on the animal or they reduce my reliance on fossil fuel equipment in some of those areas. Now I'm, you know, relearning things about crop rotation. And and this is where we can come in though with economic stimulus also to enhance this. Right now in Iowa, our whole system is focused on the export of corn, soy, and livestock. 
we haven't spent of, of the literally billions of dollars we've spent in the state since I started farming in, in 1994. We haven't spent a penny on, say, a local freezing facility for produce. We haven't spent a penny on food hubs. We haven't spent a penny on, sand, on a press that would allow farmers to diversify their rotations with oil seeds. Um, we haven't done anything to help. I'm trying to figure out how to build a packing, a, a small packing plant for me and some of my friends. And it's, it's one of those, I'm 52. I don't know if I really want to do this or not because my daughter doesn't want to farm. But on the other hand, I know that something's got to give because what we've got right now isn't working. It's not working for the consumer. It's not working for the livestock. And, and you guys as taxpayers are propping it up. And, and at the same time, I've got to make sure that our consumers care enough that I can make this little packing plant work. So again, those would be logical areas. We've got to support farmers. You know, it's an oversupply business. We have to support us, but we should be supporting with innovation that leads to more opportunities, not just this funnel of being, being better and better and better at exporting corn, soy, and the nutrients in our soil. Sorry, I talked too long. Not at all. Those are such important points. And this issue of having a place to have your meat processed couldn't be more important to the potential to transition from a factory farm system to a regenerative system. So we have to keep going back to that and figure out these solutions. And um, you know, you're leading the way by trying to make it work um, for your community and it's not easy. So um, we all need to weigh in and help with that. I wanna take it to Garrett and Sean and go to the next piece of the Green New Deal. You know, it starts by saying, we're going to remove pollution and greenhouse gas emissions from the agricultural sector. And it sounds like it totally is technologically feasible, um, but we have to do that by supporting family farming. I thought it was so brilliant that that, that was how the Green New Deal framed this. Um, and Sean, in your introduction, you spoke a lot about the economic situation facing family farmers and the structural changes that need to be made to our economy. Um, what else do we need to know about that subject? Well, I think that um, this is actually one of the most brilliant things that the Sunrise Movement did was oftentimes we think of the environmental movement, I think before the Sunrise Movement as austerity, you can't do this, you can't do that. And really, when we're thinking about the massive challenge of addressing climate change, what it is is a huge opportunity. And that's why the Green New Deal is a jobs program, first and foremost. There is so much work to do to meet the challenge of climate change, and we are facing an economic crisis. So this is a you know a crisis. Of, we're facing multiple crises, and even before this COVID crisis, we were facing an economic and environmental crisis, and the Green New Deal is a solution to both. And when it comes to agriculture, what we're talking about is moving away from a system that is increasingly consolidated, increasingly controlled by just a few global corporate monopolies where everyone is on the treadmill that Seth was talking about of overproduction for foreign markets, cratering prices that is resulting in economic devastation. You know, like Donald Trump has sent record numbers, billions of dollars in subsidies, and those are going mainly to the largest and richest farmers um, that are operating for the benefit of a few corporate monopolies. Um, and over, and meanwhile, bankruptcies are, going through the roof. There's, it's not affecting the level of bankruptcy. So the, that underlying economic crisis still remains. And by the way, that's a bipartisan economic crisis. That This is an economic crisis that has been in motion at least since the 1980s across both Democratic and Republican administrations. So um, the solution, we know that the just like fossil fuel companies, corporate ag monopolies whose business model depends on this very specific mode of agriculture, overproduction, highly intensive pesticides, highly intensive fertilizers, and, and you know, factory farms, CAFOs, uh, that poison the water. That is their business model. So the way to move off of that um, business model that depends on polluting the water, polluting the 
or polluting the air and polluting the earth is to actually have um, many, many more farmers, many more farmers who are actually incorporating regenerative the regenerative agriculture practices that Seth was talking about into the ways that they are earning a living because they're getting um, incentives and subsidize, subsidies for doing things like um, reclaiming wetlands and regenerating soil, right? So we know that uh, the big massive corporate uh, monopolies are not going to do that on their own. That cuts, that cuts into their bottom line, but small family farmers earning a living on the land can do that and they can create um, you know, economic models that work for themselves where they're actually incorporating the environmental practices that Seth is talking about. So I think from the Sunrise model from the beginning, it was about not just the environment, uh, the environmental crisis that we're facing, but the economic crisis that we're facing. When it comes to manufacturing and infrastructure, that's about um, creating good jobs, building that. And when it comes to agriculture, it's about creating economic pathways for more small family farmers um, and more farmers on the land to earn a living farming by um, and incorporating into that earnings, um, doing in, incorporating environmental practices. Absolutely. So Garrett, let's take it to you. Now, I know that you're in your own family history, your family wasn't able to stay in, in dairy farming at least because it, it wasn't making economic sense. Of course, farmers get paid way below what it costs them to actually produce the milk and that's, <laughs> that's never gonna work. We've had so many, I mean, it continues to be a problem of dairy farmers going out of business and dairies being consolidated into very large factory farms. The other issue that you raised when you started out your talk tonight is about how there was a push to develop land around South Bend that was really, really great farmland. So how are we not valuing, you know, how can we, how are we not valuing what farmers produce enough to pay them what it actually costs them to produce it? And how come we're not valuing farmland enough to keep it in farmland and, you know, disallowing this urban sprawl to destroy really what should be profitable lands. From your perspective on these local issues that you, you ran on, what can you tell us about this situation? Yeah, absolutely. It was it was eye-opening to me because you know we talk about all the issues here that are going on. There's so many issues uh, to begin with. And then uh, when I moved home back here to South Bend, realized that they were gonna develop on 22,000 acres, like the, si the size of the city of South Bend. Uh, this is the old Kankakee marshland, some of the best farmland in the country. Um, also on top of our aquifer, which is one of the healthiest and the largest in our region. Um, and one of the only ones in the country that's actually regenerating. So uh, on so many levels was concerned about the, uh, the proposal. And I think for me, it just, it showed that we don't have a plan, right? There's no, there's no national plan for how we're going to tackle all of these joint crises of climate change, of uh, you know, a small farm crisis being monopolized, like Sean said, by large companies that are extracting more and more wealth from rural America, um, and the crises of food that we have in our country of like a very obese, unhealthy country that is slowly rotting to the core. Um, and that was for me just a huge symbol of that, that there was no plan here that there, you know, folks in our economic development office in our county could choose to develop on you know, a size of the a, a size of land that entire the size of the city of South Bend. Um, and what's been really beautiful though out of this is that we have we got organizing, right? We didn't we didn't say that, oh, this is just gonna happen. We started talking to our neighbors. We started bringing folks from the city of South Bend out to the rural part of the country to talk to the farmers. And we built what is a pretty unique rural urban partnership. And for the first time in my life, uh, I've seen Farmers and environmentalists at the same county, uh, the same county meetings, fighting for the same uh, initiatives to stop this this proposal. Um, and I think it's been one of the first experiences that I've seen where there's actually been a real sharing of knowledge of challenges of farming and the the the, the treasure that we have here of our soil that we should preserve and invest in, and the concerns that we see long term about how this is going to be a really important. Uh, 
resource for our community. If we look down the road at what we're gonna need to do uh, in terms of addressing the climate crisis, we have to preserve uh, every bit of farmland like Seth was talking about. There are some places where we shouldn't be farming. There are some places where we are gonna be, it's gonna be impossible to farm in my lifetime. You know, they're already projecting, if we don't do anything right now and we stay as is with our emissions, the climate of Indiana will look like modern day Texas in my lifetime. What is that going to mean for the countless farmers like my family who rely on this land? And what is that gonna mean for the people south of here <laughs> who will have climates that look something like Mexico or central, you know, in deserts? <laughs> so uh, we already have th these, these impending crises. And then we have just reckless economic development, like you said. We have urban sprawl that's been going on really un unhalted, uh, unaddressed for decades. Um, so what I'm excited about is that we do have an opportunity, uh, like Sean said, um, this, if, if things go right this fall and we elect people who understand these issues, uh, we will have hopefully one small and uh, powerful window to pass legislation that could not only preserve our farmland and make sure that we have a clear mandate to protect the best farmland across this country for that purpose and invest in it, um, but also to make sure that farmers, more farmers have access to land, to, to tools that can allow them to farm sustainably, and that we can reinvest in rural America, which has been robbed, honestly, for the past many decades of its wealth. So it's been, it's been frustrating here to see this happen, but it's also been really uh, inspiring <laughs> to see this new coalition form. Um, we have our local county commissioner races here um, that will eventually decide on this this fall. And it's also been a reminder to me, and I will just tell all of you that a lot of these land decisions are done in your local offices. <laughs> and it is incredibly important that the people in your county commissioner offices your county council, whoever it is that controls land use and zoning are people who understand these issues. Because until that day, we're gonna still see these issues cropping up again and again and again. And we're not gonna actually arrive at the transformative land policy that I think all of us here would like to see. Yeah, that's that's so important, Garrett. Yeah, so everybody needs to, to get a copy of their ballot in advance of election day, read down through all of the offices that are on the ballot. A lot of them won't have party affiliations, so you're going to actually have to research the candidates and be prepared. And be prepared, of course, to vote on whatever ordinances or uh, uh, local ballot initiatives are are on there as well. Um, yeah, that's really important. And our our daily lives are decided by the local politics and the local decision makers. So, and most of us aren't really in touch with that as much as we are with local pol or national politics. So I wanna stay with you, Garrett, because I know having run for office during uh, the coronavirus, um, I'm sure that you met a lot of voters who just have unfathomable needs right now. Their, their kids are not in school. They're not getting school lunches. You know, if they got food stamps, that was never enough, but it's, you know, when, when you just, when everything's falling apart, when you don't have a job, when there's no social infrastructure, um, yeah, the shit hit the fan really hard for just about everybody in this country. And I, I know that you've probably been interacting with people, more people than most of us have on a daily basis running for office. Um, what's happening in the South Bend area? What are some things that are working? What are some models for the Green New Deal in terms of what it says about making sure that everybody has access, universal access to healthy food. That's, you mentioned earlier about how the, the COVID crisis has just shown that our health is so fragile. You know, it, if, if you're in great health, if you've got plenty of vitamin D, if you're eating healthy food, you're, you're not gonna get knocked down by COVID like you would be if you have diabetes, if you're overweight, if you have these, these comorbidities as we call them. Um, but it's, it's mostly about people not actually having access. It's just, we don't have a fair system. It's not like people are just choosing to eat crap food. It's crap food is what's available if you're, if you're poor and you don't have a lot of options or if it's the part of the, the country or the town that you live in. 
Um, so Garrett, tell us a little bit about that. What's working, what's not, and, and what changes need to be made? Yeah, absolutely. It was really humbling to talk to people on the phone. I mean, we were in uh, lockdown mode during most of the campaign, so I was mostly calling voters. So although I didn't get that personal experience, at least got to talk to a lot of people who were really in the thick of things. And at that time, we didn't really quite, I don't think many of us really quite understood what we were in for. <laughs> um, so at the time, you know, I was talking to voters who were getting kicked off of their Medicaid here in Indiana because they couldn't afford a $3 copay uh, every month that they required to pay. Um, I remember talking to one voter who was, uh, had just gotten kicked off. Her, her glasses had broken, so she couldn't see and she was uh, paralyzed. So she couldn't even take, and she couldn't uh, go get public transit or anything. Um, and she was, she only had food stamps to like the next week um, and was worried if, if the state was gonna like allow her to be on Medicaid again so that she could get the care she needed to, to be able to see and, and do the things to be able to survive. Um, I had many conversations like that with that was incredibly, incredibly sobering about the realities that is kind of hidden behind so many front doors in America where there's actually a lot of private suffering, but not a lot of public exposure to it. And like you said, we're seeing here in South Bend that the uh, inequities are just tracing the, inistic, the existing inequities that we've seen in our society writ large. Um, here in South Bend, uh, most of the cases for COVID have happened on our west side, which is our Latino and black population, which is the poorer side of South Bend. Those are the communities that have, uh, you know, we have school buses out with Wi-Fi so that kids can get access to Wi-Fi to be able to have uh, classes during the day. And that's also where they get school lunches. <laughs> um, so we've also seen the incredible value of our public school system to be able to provide food for people during most of this past nine months. Um, we're not talking just about one meal a day. This is like sometimes three meals a day through the school system. And, the real changes that we need to see are that we need to be able to provide services so that people aren't in these situations to begin with, right? Um, not only from healthcare, but to these school situations. When I look at why, why we don't have uh, great internet here in South Bend, where we have some of the, we have fibers coming through our city that provide access to the best internet in Chicago, but we don't have most people don't have access to good internet here, not only in the city of South Bend, but especially in our rural parts where it's just, you can't even get it. I grew up, I submitted my college application to Notre Dame while sitting outside the public library at midnight on New Year's Eve. <laughs> so I know what it's like to not have internet where I grew up. Um, that's a basic thing that we, every state needs to be working on, getting internet to people, so they have access to basic necessities. And then we need to in, improve things like, uh, you know, I think schools, school food is a huge area where we can not only hit the education part of getting kids working in fields, understanding how to grow food, but also seeing how to cook and make good food. We have such a lack of a uh, food culture in this country, but if we actually got food into our schools, um, you know, we're learning so much more these days about how beneficial it is to have kids around farm animals, to have kids in the, in the soil have access to nature. These are incredibly important skills and uh, social environments for our, for our students, but it's entirely absent. It's been entirely removed. Even the basic like home ec classes where you learn how to fry an egg are completely removed from our classroom uh, curriculum. So from, from a state level, states are where school curriculums are made. Um, that was one of the exciting things that I was excited to do at our state level is to look at our curriculum and see how we can invest more uh, education into um, both food, but across the sustainability spectrum to um, you know, renewable energy and uh, home initiatives to improve efficiency in your home, all kinds of things students are excited and able to do. So we really need to get at the root of that. And I think education is one of the key areas that uh, we need to look at at, at the state level in order to really drive this transition for the next generation. Because I think young people are eager to be a part of this transition. They don't really have the skills or the knowledge always to be able to fully uh, take part. And that for me during this crisis was one thing that just was very apparent, the lack of, of food, <laughs> uh, good food for our kids because it's been one of the cruxes that has uh, been uh, really uh, exposed during the COVID pandemic. Yeah, I know that this is an issue that all the other panelists are very 
passionate about as well. So let's go to Seth Watkins. I know when I interviewed you for the Farmers and Ranchers for the Green New Deal podcast, this was something that was really close to your heart. So um, yeah, so the Green New Deal says we should all have universal access to healthy food. As a farmer, I know that that's the reason why you do what you do. Yeah, I, I just, I really appreciate what Garrett said in that I watched this, you know, my first experience with seeing how things were out of whack. I really appreciated what Michelle Obama did to try to help our food, our, our school lunch program. You know, I'm kind of in the middle of a commercial agriculture area. So all the anti-propaganda started flowing in about not enough calories and kids will be hungry and this and that. And I thought, you know, where's this coming from? And it was on our school board. So to, to deal with it, I just asked our head lunch lady to make lunch for all the school board and we ate it and it was the best school lunch I'd ever had. But anyway, what was devastating to me is the same year ConAgra lobbied and decided that a slice of frozen pizza would constitute a vegetable. And, you know, to me, there's just some things that should be off limits from that kind of crap. And the way our kids eat is one. And, and uh, the potential for a small district. You know, I, I talked about this. Um, one of the projects we tried to do was to just take the district and buy 160 acres of land. A lot of districts have adequate money and like their physical plant and equipment fund. And you could have taken that money as an investment, no different than a CD, and put the kids to work on it. And, and again, this is a case, an opportunity to do both. I think education should be about showing us what we're capable of. So, you know, have some failures too. So fine, we're Iowa, let's take of that 160, let's take 80 and raise corn and soy just like our moms and dads do. But let's take the other 80 and make it an ecological model for what we're capable of and all the other things we can raise. And, and then again, you follow through with the next steps of not only raising that food, but, but preparing that food. You go, uh, my daughter, when she was in, in Lego League, their, their contest was food waste. And uh, her suggestion was they should have a pig outside the school, you know, to be eating the food waste. And that was a little too radical for some of the parents. But every, every schoolyard should have some pigs and chickens running around. It. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw in the, the most exciting thing I've seen this year. Have you all seen the Cluster Cluck 5000? This, this great farmer in northern Iowa has figured out a way to run pigs, chickens, and sheep all between his cornrows and this, and this little machine. So they're outside, it's brilliant. And, and this guy, you know, he's like a rocket scientist. He's got all the technology going on and he's an agronomist. So it's not, this isn't Seth Watkins talking about you over a 12 pack of bush light. This is someone that really knows what he's doing. And we should have one of those in every schoolyard. And, 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 and again, part of it is it's that responsibility you learn. You know, we're not necessarily teaching our kids to be farmers. We're giving them these great skills. And, and, and they'll come home and share it with the parents. You know, these are things that have such a huge impact. We've proven how this works with uh, You know, a hundred years ago, we proved this. And we're just carrying on at the next level. So much good would come from that. The Cluster Cluck 5000. <laughs> Everyone I... check that out. It yeah, is... okay. It All is right. the high point of agriculture for 2020. I'm serious. I am so excited about this thing. That's awesome. Well, Mackenzie, I know that this is something that you're passionate about as well. Um, what would be your ideal campaign around school lunches? And it was great to hear from Garrett that that's one of the things that's actually working in South Bend, that the schools have really stepped up to make sure kids can get to eat. So Mackenzie, how can we improve this? What would you do with school lunches? I feel like a huge part of um, getting healthier lunches, especially in higher ed, is exposing um, these big three corporations that have deals with the, with the schools. And so there's a great group called Uprooted and Rising. Actually, I can pop their link in the chat, um, but their mission is to end white supremacy and big ag in higher education. And they're part of the Real Meals campaign. And what they're doing is really um, opposing the deals between higher ed institutions and these big food companies. So I, I think um, a, a lot of what we need to do first is really kind of follow the money and expose this. And that goes for all of the ed agriculture education that we're getting at 
higher education, um, a lot of the times the education that people are getting, um, when you trace the money back, it's because these programs have been funded by Bayer, Monsanto, or Syngenta, Syngenta and, and Cargill and all these and all these companies. So that would be my suggestion. And then of course, linking that will provide the room to be able to link them up with, with amazing farm, regenerative farmers that could provide this food instead. Yeah. So Sean, I'm sure you've got something to say on this subject, but, and you can, but I also want to, to move to the next topic because the Green New Deal, um, you know, we've already gone through what the Green New Deal says about supporting family farms, investing in soil health, ensuring universal access to healthy food. That's the whole food and ag piece of the Green New Deal. But the Green New Deal also has some other things that certainly apply to the food system and to agriculture. And one of them is that the Green New Deal calls for guaranteeing a job with a family sustaining wage, adequate family and medical leave, paid vacations, and retirement security to all people of the United States. Now, when I read that thinking about the food system, I realized like, okay, there's just nobody in the food system who has a job like that. You know, it's not just restaurant workers and farm workers. You know, most farmers are getting paid below the cost of production. They don't have, they can't take a vacation. It's hard to take a vacation as a farmer to get somebody to run your farm for you while you're out of town. But you know, it's just not happening. And certainly with COVID and the economic crisis, you know, I don't know, it's just, it seems like a pipe dream, but, but Sean, tell us what could make this possible and why we deserve to, to get this in food and ag, just like other sectors. Yeah, I mean, I think this really hits to the point that um, Seth was making earlier that only one to two percent of people are farmers. And we have a lot of people living in rural communities who have been living through major economic crises. And obviously, CAFOs make um, rural communities a lot less livable when you can't drink uh, the water and you can't even open the window because there's a CAFO nearby, like that makes rural communities less livable. But also jobs have been um, really um, leaving rural areas. And with the Green New Deal jobs guarantee, what we're talking about is giving people who live in rural areas, like maybe Seth's daughter, who doesn't want to be a farmer, an opportunity to actually like build a life in rural areas by getting a good job that pays a decent wage, a family sustaining wage that, um, and has benefits, you know, like, so like healthcare benefits, right? So what we're talking about, it, you know, in a lot of rural communities, um, the major employers are healthcare facilities, and educational facilities and other governmental facilities, right? So um, rural communities are facing a massive, massive um, healthcare crisis because hospitals are closing down. One of the barriers to farming, but a barrier to just living in rural communities generally is the lack of access to any sort of healthcare. If you are a pregnant woman and you need to drive two hours to the nearest hospital, rural communities aren't very livable. So um, the Green New Deal is not just about farming, but it's also about making rural communities vibrant places for all people um, and providing jobs so that people can see a future in rural communities, whether that's a future um, providing, you know, uh, providing child care or elder care or installing um, rural broadband or creating, um, you know, renewable electrical grids. There's tons and tons of work. And I think like the idea is to not just um, revitalize and uh, revitalize agriculture and make agriculture a more viable career option, but to make uh, to create all kinds of different job opportunities so that rural communities are places where young people see a future in. Yeah, that's very important to expand the universe of this question. Yeah, because you need to have a full scale, vibrant economy, not just, you know, random farmers way out in the wilderness doing their own thing. Yeah, it doesn't work. Because um, then probably then all you've got is Walmart to shop at and your, your core of your community is hollowed out. Um, 
All right. So there are a bunch of things that I want to address, and I know that time is running short, but I, I do want, since this is the Green New Deal panel, I want to just look at one more piece of the Green New Deal that I think is important to the agricultural sector. And it's connecting to Indigenous Peoples Day was yesterday. And also we have, um, you know, agriculture starts with land theft and slavery in the United States. And the Green New Deal actually tackles these issues. It actually talks about promoting justice and equity by stopping current, preventing future and repair, repairing historic oppression. And then it talks about historic oppression in the United States, which has been focused on indigenous peoples, communities of color, migrant communities, deindustrialized communities, depopulated rural communities, as we were just talking about, the poor, low-income workers, women, the elderly, the unhoused, people with disabilities, and youth. And so the Green New Deal specifically says that this resolution is going to address the needs of these frontline and vulnerable communities and put them forward, put them first. Um, again, this is just so important for agriculture because agriculture is based in this country on this oppression. Like just think about you know, the history of slavery, but that bleeding into the way that migrant workers are, are treated currently, how they're not really considered full workers under US labor laws don't get these protections. So I'm sure that all of you would like to weigh in on, on this. Um, who would like to start? How about Sean? We just had you, but um, <laughs> I, you look like you're chomping at the bit to answer this question. You know, it's, it's such an important question. And I think there's a, a couple of questions that came up in the chat here. Um, and I think the Green New Deal, again, presents a huge opportunity, right? If we are going to break up corporate ag and break up big ag, then we are, and we want to put more farmers onto the land, there's going to be opportunities for first time farmers, young farmers, people of color farmers to take up um, that space to, uh, and to kind of, if we're able to like shatter some of cor uh, big corporate ag stranglehold, like there's a lot of room for people to come up through the through the cracks. And I'm really excited about that because for so long, um, it's you know there there for so long people, so many different people have been shut out. And I think it's a, a really important point that you're making about farm workers because. We talk about the Green New Deal, but one of the major um, uh, flaws of the original New Deal is that uh, while it was creating great middle class jobs for a lot of uh, people, particularly white people, it was specifically carved out, it specifically carved out um, jobs that were held by um, people of color, that car, uh, domestic workers who are largely black women were not included in the New Deal and farm workers who are uh, obviously black and um, Latino immigrants were carved out of the New Deal um, or were carved out of the big investments, were carved out of the massive uh, wave of labor protections also. So when we kind of reprise the New Deal in the Green New Deal, we want to share the same level of, of ambition. What we want to um, kind of shoot for the stars in the same way, but we obviously want to do things very, very differently and um, providing oper and opening up opportunity um, for all people of color is one of the major ways the Green New Deal will be different than the previous New Deal. Mm -hmm. Mackenzie, I wanna to go to you next because you did, you authored two additional data for progress reports one that addressed land access, which might be a way that we can tackle reparations on some level in this country. Um, and then also you had a report on farm workers. So if you could just brief us on, on those reports and, and where we can go to to learn more about them. Yeah, and, and just echoing everything Sean said, I mean, and we can talk about regenerative agriculture and better practices till we're blue in the face. But the fact of the matter is if people you know, beginner and socially disadvantaged farmers don't have access to land, this isn't gonna work. Um, and in 1910, one in seven farmers were African-American. 
and over the next century, 98% of black farmers were dispossessed, resulting in 90% of black um, owned farmland that was lost. And so this is the window of opportunity that we have to redistribute land. Um, and yeah, like Alexa said, we wrote a memo about this and um, I will also put that in the chat if people are interested in just some policies that we are recommending to redistribute land and lower the barriers for people who wanna farm, especially for um, black indigenous people of color farmers. Okay. Well, we made it through all of the essential pieces of the Green New Deal for our discussion, but I really encourage anyone who hasn't actually just read the text of the Green New Deal to do it. It's a beautiful document, it's beautifully written, and I think it inspires a lot of thinking about like these are important goals and how do we achieve them. And it's not it's not a finite document, it's a living document, it's kind of like a constitution and it gets fleshed out through political platforms and through legislation. Um, but I want to wrap it up by just going quickly through the things that we need that are Green New Deal-esque to transition from factory farming to regenerative agriculture, especially for uh, raising animals for food and processing them. Um, one issue that we didn't touch on tonight is the crisis in slaughterhouses uh, in the big meat packing plants where so many people have died and become sick from COVID because because the nation was not willing to protect these so-called essential workers. And, um, and then on the other end of that, you have farmers like Seth who are trying to figure out how they're going to get their animals processed because they can't compete with the, the, big, um, the big four, Tyson, Cargill, et cetera, who are taking up the only slaughterhouse space available. There's just not so much middle ground. Um, Sean, I think you earlier mentioned the Food System Reform Act. So let's start with that. Give us a little rundown of what the Food System Reform Act is, how we can support it, and then we'll go quickly through some other legislative solutions. Um, actually, I feel like I know the very basics. I think like I would uh, turn it back to you to get into the specifics. Well, let's just do the basics. So like one thing I really like about the Farm System Reform Act is that it addresses the plight of contract farm uh, contract farmers? So you know, when I was a young vegetarian, I thought I just needed to convince the farmers of the United States to treat their animals right, and they could just do things differently. And it wasn't until I was way into my career at Organic Consumers Association that I came to learn that, well, most farmers are operating under contracts with companies like Tyson. And Tyson dictates everything about how the chicken is raised. You do not get to say like, oh, I think I'd like to give my chickens more space or more time outside. It's just not possible. And so one thing that the Farm System Reform Act does is it builds on a program that is operational in North Carolina where they are, um, they're buying farmers out of these abusive contracts. And, and helping farmers put their land into conservation easements. And it's, it's a one-time payment to, to make a big change. And it takes a pretty big payment to make a big change. And it's in North Carolina, they just do it for the farmers who are in flood zones because most of us have probably seen after big floods in North Carolina, cows and pigs floating towards the ocean. Um, it, and along with all of the animal waste, and you can see the big plumes of odd colored waste flowing into the ocean. We, we just have, you know, every factory farm is an environmental crisis on a daily basis. And then whenever there's a, an event, especially floods, it's an environmental crisis for everybody who's within probably hundreds of miles around. Um, so that's just one little piece of it. But the, but the idea of it is like to get the farmers out of these abusive relationships and into something workable and shift the subsidies that are encouraging farmers to do the wrong thing, which we've talked tonight a lot about. Um, Seth, you raised the, the core issue, which is you need a place to process your animals. Your neighbors also need this. You're ready, you're willing, you wanna put all the resources you have towards this, but it's not easy because for one thing, it's a, a federal system. You need to have a USDA 
inspected processing plant. And I've talked to other farmers, like for instance, ranchers in Colorado. And I said, oh, well, hey, there's this great program. You can get a million dollars um, for value added processing grants if you have matching funds. And she said to me, she goes, a million dollars? It would cost $25 million to make a processing plant of scale just for the, just the grass fed, you know, cattle ranchers, just the people who doing it, who are doing it right in, in Western Colorado, where of course you can graze a whole lot of cattle. Um, but that's, so, so what are the nuts and bolts? And if we're like Garrett and we wanna run for office, we wanna organize locally, what can we do to help process or help farmers get processing and Maybe Mackenzie, you can talk to us about what consumers can do. Um, how do we, you know, with our dollars, move this in the right direction? So we'll do kind of a rapid round robin on the core issue, starting with Seth. Seth, you're on mute. I'm sorry. If it's if it's eat local, buy local, you know, I'm I'm actually it'd be good to come back and talk to you guys in about a month, because I I what I'm finding is a plant that processes 40 calves a day is enough to capitalize on the economy of scale. Um, the challenge is finding that market and that support to eat and buy local. Now I'm I'm seeing a model in the in the Pacific Northwest on on fruits and vegetables and and tree nuts that's brought enough farmers together to go to a scale that they can supply a supermarket. So that seems feasible. Um, I actually posed the question today to the uh, Iowa Department of Ag of what is the very smallest I can build and still be state inspected because, and this is important, you know, you need to be inspected. That's for everyone's safety, that's, a, that's essential. And uh, I'm curious to see if I can buy, build something that I just process two of my own calves a week myself. Maybe I'll go learn how to be a butcher. And, you know, really that's like my retirement plan. That'd be awesome. Um, that might not solve some of the problems we're talking about here, but I'm trying to find out if this concept of 40 head a day would meet the regional need. And then we could also expand with that. I think it's very important that this plant <clears throat> is set up to process all species, pigs, chickens, turkeys, you know, sheep, goats. Um, so it needs to have that diversity. I don't think it'll be $25 million. Um, the idea I have for my own place is actually like a refrigerated trailer that has two different zones, one for freezing and one for hanging meat. And uh, that might be $40,000 if I do all the work myself. So, you know, let me give you an answer on that soon. One thing I do want to emphasize though, and, and you touched on this when you asked about underserved people, we've got to do something to show the migrant workers at our packing plants that we care about them. This is really important to me. And, and the example I'll give, my industry, my livelihood would have collapsed without their efforts going into those plants every day. And, and they've dealt with so much. And, and I know jobs are important and I, I want to support them in their jobs. But I got a check from the state of Iowa for $10,000 because I raised cattle to help with COVID. And, and I'm grateful, I appreciate that, but I feel like somehow either myself or a lot of that money should have gone to them is what I'm saying. I wouldn't be here without them. If you, you know, I, we've got to, if you have eaters can help me figure out a way to organize, figure out a way to care for some of their families that have been impacted. I wanna do that in the here and now, then I wanna work on my packing plant. And, Maybe even someone would like to work for me someday, you know, or, or maybe it could be a co-op where they own the darn thing. I'm, uh, I'm open to any ideas and I'm at a point in my life, I just want to figure out a way that I don't have to ship my calves somewhere else to be processed. All right, thank you, Seth. There is an organization that does work on helping farmers like Seth figure out these issues. It's called the Niche Meat Processing Network and we'll have to have them on in a future um, installment of this webinar series to get deeper into this question. But let's go now to the issue to wrap it up. Like Mackenzie, what can individuals do? What, what's the right way to, to shift our food dollars? How can we support the people who don't have enough to eat right now 
And like Seth was saying, the workers who we deemed essential, who we forced to work during this pandemic, who took the brunt of this, but didn't, you know, some people were furloughed and got extra $600 a week checks and that was amazing, but we didn't do the same thing for our, our low wage workers who were out in the pandemic. So I'll, I'll let Garrett and Mackenzie and Sean all comment on that to wrap it up, starting with Mackenzie. Yeah, I mean, I'm always hesitant to put responsibility on individual consumers because it's a really hard to access the type of food we're talking about and it's really difficult to afford it. That being said, I think if all hundred of us on this panel right now reached out to our people in our local offices and told them things that are important to us, like protecting farm workers, I mean, a healthy food system isn't just about the food, right? It has to be about the people producing it, like Seth said. So talk to them about, um, you know, the people at these meat packing places and say all of the things, you know, all the issues that are important to you. And if everybody did that and focus on the local elections, like that's when we can really make change. And of course, if there's farmers like Seth at your farmer's market, support them. But when we focus too much on individual actions, we're missing the, the whole issue of the fact that corporate consolidation has taken over our food system. And so I would encourage you to, to reach out to, to your local, um, you know, people in your, your, your district and tell them what's important to you. Yeah, I would just um, really 100% agree with Mackenzie. Um, I think maybe Mackenzie and Garrett would know this statistic better than I do, but like, you know, uh, I think like something like over half of all greenhouse gases are created by 70 companies, right? And I think um, the idea of, you know, each of us, indivi our individual consumer choices being something that will address this massive crisis that a very few number of corporate monopolies have created is I think the wrong way to look at it. What we need to do is rein in these massive corporate monopolies that are squeezing farmers, that are, uh, that are bankrupting farmers, that are leaving consumers with not enough choices, that are overcharging consumers, underpaying farmers and destroying our planet like the taking on those corporations is what we really need to do to solve this problem. Different people have different consumer choices based on their geography and based on their income. But what we all have is a political voice. And what we all have is the ability to talk to our neighbors and exercise our political will so that we can actually take on um, those corporations that are uh, impoverishing us and killing us. Um, through legislation and through political action. Yeah, I'll just close up by, uh, I saw in the questions at the beginning of the, the round, some people talking about the Green New Deal and what the Biden and Harris administration would look like. I just wanna remind everyone that we, when FDR was elected president, he wasn't, Going, he wasn't necessarily the the the, uh, the champion of the what we now understand as the New Deal. Uh, when uh, President Johnson was elected, he wasn't necessarily the champion of civil rights. Um, that it was people organizing their communities, mobilizing to force our elected leaders to take what we want them to do uh, and put pass that into law. So um, a lot of people are disappointed in in how the the. Biden and Harris campaign has been talking about the Green New Deal. I share that disappointment. I'm quite frustrated, in fact, with how they've been disregarding a lot of people. I imagine they're on this call that feel really passionate about this and that have done so much work to move this issue to the forefront of our politics. But do not give up hope because we are here and in Sunrise and many other organizations are, are ready to mobilize after the election, both to ensure there's a fair and, and fair election in our country but also to make sure that we press, press whoever is elected into office and whatever uh, Congress situation we have to address this crisis. And I, I only believe that we will really reach that until we get the right people in office paired with a large so social mobilization that is big enough to transform the common sense of, of our uh, society. 
I think at the underlying root of all that we're talking about is that none of our food system right now makes sense, right? It doesn't make sense for the workers, it doesn't make sense for the land, and it doesn't make sense for everyone who's eating it at the end of their fork. So we have to transform the common sense. We are a part of that right now on this call and talking about it, but truly it will happen when we transform our politics to decide that we want to build a country that works for everyone, that works for the land, the animals and the people that are tending to it. So uh, that's the, the mission I'm on this fall. Definitely go out and vote and make sure that you are following your local elections and, and pushing them. Um, and if you're excited to figure out how to run yourself, feel free to reach out to me. would love to talk. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Garrett, Garrett Vlad, Seth Watkins, Sean Sebastian, Mackenzie Feldman. You guys are all amazing tonight. Thank you for a great conversation. Thanks to everybody who participated. Not everyone got their questions answered, but we can continue to have this discussion on Facebook. This video is, is posted on Facebook. It'll be later posted on our YouTube. So we can continue that conversation there. And I'll see you all at the next webinar for the Boycott Big Meat campaign. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks everyone for joining. Everyone, have a good night. Thank you everyone.